Hello, today I would like to do a little tutorial on some basic uh, NX assembly topics. Uh, we're going to talk about assembly structure, how to add components, and how to do some constraints. I'm just going to use something pretty basic. Uh, you can see I've already got this guy uh, assembled and then in an exploded view. So I'm going to show you guys how to do that also. and. Uh, see what else I can think about as I'm going through this that maybe I'll add to that. So for this assembly, I have drawn all the parts already, uh, and then I'm going to assemble it and put everything in the right spot. So we'll go back to uh, before I had an assembly model here and uh, go ahead and start a new one. So when you're ready to start an assembly model, uh, that assembly file needs to be a separate part file. So when we go to file and new, I'm going to change what my template I'm using here from the model template to the assembly template and hit OK. Now that should do a couple things for you. It starts a new assembly file. It should automatically put you into the assemblies uh, application. If you go to application tab up here, there's a, an assemblies application. It's just an on off application. So you can have it on uh, while you're using the assembly modeling tools and you can turn it off if somebody else in your, uh, in your workspace needed to use the assemblies modeling uh, license that you have and you don't have enough for everybody, uh, you can turn it off and on, um, but it is a separate license. Uh, but anyway, once you get into the assembly file, you're going to get the add component dialog box up automatically. And it's going to show you a list of the parts that you have open currently. Uh, if you need to find a part that's not listed here, that's something you've saved maybe a day or two ago and it's not loaded today, there's also an option to come down here and hit the open and get a browser uh, to go and find where your part file is. So you're not stuck with just what's open. You don't have to have everything open when you start a new assembly file. All right, so I'm gonna add the bracket. When you bring it in, uh, it wants to kind of default the orientation of the part based on the work coordinate system in that part file and how it's oriented in your assembly file. So it may not come in in exactly the right orientation that you want, which is okay if we can move it around once we get it in the, the part here. Um, so down below, you got a couple different options. You can change the location anchors. Like I said, there's not going to be a lot I can do with this right now because of the way I drew this part um, just by doing the location. Snap lets you pick a point, and it puts the origin of that part file, whatever you select on the screen. Um, the absolute puts it the origin from that part file at the origin location for the assembly file. Uh, there's some things down here you can do to cycle the orientation so you can um, flip the direction, reverse the Z direction, and rotate it basically 90 degrees about the Z axis. doesn't really matter because I'm going to move this part in a minute anyway because I don't like the orientation of it anyway. Um, down below, it says placement. I can constrain it or I can select this option to move it. Um, this is what I want to do ultimately, but uh, when you do the move in this area it's without using the actual move component command, you're kind of limited on what you can do with it. So you're really limited just to using the drag handles. Um, so I can move it around and get it where I want it. And I'm just going to hit OK and just add that component for now. Now, once you do that, it says create fix constraint. It says you just added the first component to your assembly. Do you want to fix it use a fixed constraint, which means it's that component cannot move. I cannot uh, change its orientation or its location. I don't want to do that yet. Um, I can do that later because the reason is I want to show you the move command and I want to also put the center of this hole on the zero, zero, zero of this assembly file to locate it there. So I skip that for now, but I can come back and do it later. So I'm going to right-click on that component. You can right-click on it on the screen also. Um, in the middle here, uh, we've got a tool that says Move. So the Move tool has some different options. Um, 
it says motion right here. If you click the down arrow on that, there's all kinds of different things you can do to move this component. So the dynamic one is going to use the drag handles to do your moving. So there's a lot of things you can do with the drag handles. You can rotate it and whatnot. I just use those. Um, distance lets you pick a vector and type in a, an actual physical dimension to move it. Angle, same thing. You type in a vector and rotate it about a point at a specific angle. Um, the one of the most, I'm not going to go through all of them, but one of the most useful ones for me is always point to point. So with point to point, I can move uh, and select a point on my part. So that's going to be the from point. So I pick the center of this hole and then specify a two point. I can go ahead and select something physically on the part or I can go to uh, this little point dialog and type in a coordinate or do some other things with it. You can change the selection point, but what I want to do is move it to zero, zero, zero. So it's already set to that. I hit OK, and it moves my component to that point. Okay, so point to point works pretty well for getting things in the right spot. Ultimately, though, we want to be able to constrain these parts so that they have some kind of relationship to each other. Um, so moving is nice when you're not to the point where you want to constrain things yet, um, but like I said, you want to get constraints eventually because you're going to change these parts. We're going to make modifications to them. So we're going to need to be able to make sure that they stay oriented in the right position or show us when there's a problem if we make a change to a part that causes an issue with our assembly. All right, so now I'm going to fix this part, though. I want to go back and go to my assembly constraints tab, and <clears throat> we'll talk about some of the rest of these in a minute. But there is a fix button here. I'm going to hit fix, grab that component, and just hit apply. Okay, so, like I said, we'll come back and talk about these assembly constraints. But if you're coming from another CAD system, these are pretty similar to the constraints that you've had before, in uh, whether it be Inventor or SolidWorks or whatever. Uh, some of the naming may sound a little different, but they're basically going to do the exact same thing that you're used to. <clears throat> All right, so the next step is going to be to add a, another component. So we're going to go to the assemblies tab up here and we're going to hit add. And I'm going to pick the next piece. That's going to be the spacer piece. And I'm just going to hit apply on that. And I want to do a little bit of looking at this part. Um, so it kind of looks like it put it in the right spot which maybe it did because of how the coordinate system was. I have a feeling it was actually interfering with that part. So I want to move it up a little bit here and then I'll show you how to constrain that. So we'll do assembly constraints again. So there's a couple different things you can do when you're working with a part like this. So if we go to the touch and align, there's some options in here as far as what it does. Prefer touch. That's going to put two faces up against each other like so. So if I put touch on, it's going to move those faces so that they touch. Now the parts just happen to line up in the center still because of that's how I have the coordinate system drawn for that part. If I hit OK on that and go to move for this component, I can still move it all over the place. I just can't move it up because it's constrained this face to touch that face. Okay. Let's undo that. Let's go back and look at some other options in the prefer touch. <clears throat> There's one that you can tell it to use the touch command automatically. Prefer touch is kind of like an invert. It'll do other things while you have that selected, depending on what you pick. Um, touch will only do touch. Align. If I wanted this face to be on the same plane as, say, this face and facing the same direction, that's where I would use align. So those two faces are now the same direction. Their normal direction is pointing the same way, and they're lined up on the same plane. Another option in the touch align is one that's called infer center axis. Infer center axis will allow you to pick a circular face and it will align the center axes of those faces. 
So that one's a pretty important one because when we're lining things up, sometimes we don't always have a point that we need uh, the centers to be on the same exact plane, but we need the axes of those two parts to line up. And do that one. Now there is another way to do a part like this. This, this spacer is supposed to sit down on this face centered on that hole through that part. Um, so there is one command that will take care of that all at once for us. So there's the next assembly constraint is called concentric. Concentric will let you pick two circular objects. So I'm gonna pick the bottom circle, just an edge of that component and pick the circular edge of that component. And what that does is it puts them on the same plane and lines their centers up. So on a part like this, this circular bushing, it would be very easy to use that constraint and skip some of the steps before where I would have had to do like a touch constraint and an align center axis constraint. Um, the concentric constraint is a little bit touchy sometimes. It's, it They have to be on the same plane. If you try to do some other constraints with it and try and have that uh, cylinder be aligned with the center of that hole, but be off of the plane, not the face is not touching. Concentric is not going to work for that. It doesn't like to do that. They have to be two edges that have to be on the same plane. All right. So the next step is going to be to bring in another component. Oh. So another thing you can do on this that I haven't shown you yet um, is to use the snap button and place it out there. <clears throat> then you can also do the constraints right here on the add uh, dialog box. So this time I'm going to do another concentric constraint. This part sits right on top of this part. And for some reason, it wasn't letting me pick that while it was shaded. Um, but you can see it automatically moves that part. It's all on the same plane. Uh, and that's all I'm going to do for constraining that part at the moment. So it's right in the right location now. Hit apply. And then you can stay in this add component dialog box and continue adding pieces. Um, so the next piece is going to be these bushings and the pivot piece. So if I add the bushings, and there's one. Um, there's something else you can do here is to add multiples. So I need two of these eventually. So if I change it to two, you can see it snaps two of them in there. And it kind of places them apart from each other so you can find them okay. Uh, on this one, I'm just going to add those because there's some things I have to do that makes constraining them a little more difficult in this dialog box. Uh, so the last piece is going to be a pivot. I only need one of those. And I'm going to move it up also. All right, so putting the bushings into this pivot piece is simple. We just use the concentric constraint again. Now on this one, this will happen occasionally. It's put them on the same plane, but uh, the orientation of the parts is not correct. So what I'm going to have to do with that one is hit reverse last constraint and it flips it over and faces the two surfaces towards each other. Um, so that one's in correct position now too. So I can hit apply and get that guy in the right spot. Now, if you remember back to the original uh, assembly I showed you, these three parts now all fit in the middle of this uh, U-support piece and lined up with the center hole. So the next step is gonna be to get that to work. Now, one thing about this assembly is the spacing between the two sides of this U-support is slightly larger than the spacing across this. Uh, so there's a little bit of clearance on that part can give a little bit when there's a bolt put through there uh, and it's tightened up. So I cannot use the, I want to put it centered. I want to make it look perfect. So I can't use the concentric constraint to put this in here because it's going to put it all the way to one side. 
and I need to have a little space on each side. So what I'm going to do with this one is go to the back to the touch and align and use the infer center axis and pick that bushing hole and that um, hole in the U support and it gets it lined up in approximately the right position. I got to do a little rotation, but it's lined up on the center. So I'm going to hit apply on that. And I want to move that constraint. I want to show you how to move all those parts first off. So over here in your assembly navigator, a couple things. I've started to add parts to this assembly. Um, the bushings, it's got a times two next to it. So it shows both bushings. And I'll show you how to change that. But I need to move all of them right now. So I'm going to highlight both of them and go to the move command and move them out and hit okay i just want to get them so that they're not lined up on that face so we can see everything um, if you want to be able to find one specific bushing so on this assembly it's not hard i can come out on the screen and pick them but if you had more of them and a lot more parts on your screen it might be hard to find a specific one you can hit the unpack button right click on the bushings hit unpack and it will list them as separate components now and then when you want to put them back together, all you have to do is right click on one of them and hit pack again. And it puts all those component instances back together. All right, so let's go back to constraining this. Um, I want to make sure that this guy is in the right rotation too. So I'm going to go and use a parallel constraint. And I'm going to do parallel to this from this face to this face. And then it's upside down, so I'm going to hit the reverse button again. Now, it rotated this part, and that's something that can happen. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But that's because I did not fully constrain this use support. Um, but I can always go back and do that. All right, so I made it parallel, so it's in the right orientation. So now the last step is going to be to get this little sub-assembly of three parts centered in the middle of this use support. So there's a command uh, in the U assembly constraints dialog box called center. And it's a little bit confusing to people uh, because it sounds like it should be something to do with circles or cylinders to center them on each other. And that's not what it's for. Uh, what it's going to do is put a component centered between uh, other faces on a part. So uh, if I just walk through it, it's a little bit easier to understand. So on this one, I'm going to use the subtype 2 to 2. I'll come back and talk about the other ones in a second. But what I'm going to do is pick this face and this face. So I pick the same face on each side of that pivot piece. And then I'm going to pick the faces on the inside of the U support. And if you look at it, it centers these parts inside of that part, if that makes sense. So it takes those two faces on the one first component and centers it between the two faces on the second component. So let's undo that real quick. So if I do one to two, what it's going to do, so let's say I pick this face, and I want to center that face in between these two faces. Now this one middle, or this one left edge of the, the pivot piece is centered between those two pieces. So depending on what you have, you can change the subtype to probably get this to work for you. If you have something that's got a plane in the middle of it, and you can center it on a plane. But this used to be something where you had to use construction geometry to get this to work until they came out with this center command. The biggest problem, like I said, is people get confused by it, thinking that it's got something to do with circles and cylinders when it doesn't. All right, so we're going to hit apply on that. So hit cancel for now. Um, before I go any further here, you can see I've got little graphical representations of the constraints all out on my screen right now. If that bothers you, which most people it probably does, uh, if I go over to my assembly navigator, you can see there's a little constraints icon here and I hit the plus, I can find all of them. But if I right click on that, I can hit this little checkbox that says display constraints and graphics window and turn it off. So now it does not show them anymore. Uh, so it kind of cleans up the screen a little bit. All right, so let's go back to this assembly. 
So I've got everything pretty well constrained, except this part is rotated now when I assembled it to those. Um, so there's a couple things I can do here. I can go and move it. And when I move this, it's going to move the other components with it since they're constrained to it. Okay, so it's still got some freedom to be able to move. I can constrain that now if I want to. There's all kinds of ways I can constrain it. If I want it to be angled, I can use an angular constraint and put an angle between that face and that face and call it 30 degrees and get that lined up and hit OK. So now if that's how it's supposed to be assembled. Everything's fully constrained or constrained well enough. Uh, this spacer is not fully constrained. I can still move it. Uh, these bushings, I can still rotate them. Same with the spacer, I can spin it around. But that really doesn't matter for this assembly, so I'm not going to get concerned about making sure everything was fully constrained. Now, if you've gotten everything constrained and you want to move some components to see how things are working, uh, one real easy way to do that is to come over here to your constraints. There's an actual constraints box too that you can change the navigator to a constraints navigator, which shows you a little more information for your constraints. Um, so if I hit the plus next to this angle, it tells me what parts it's uh, it's associated with. But I can click that off so I can suppress that constraint. And now I can come back out here and move these components again. I can spin it around. And if I want to put it back, I can just turn the assembly constraint back on. All right, so now we've got this thing assembled and I'm going to talk to you about a few other things that you might find useful when working in assemblies. Uh, so back to our assembly navigator for a second. Let's say you want to make a change to one of the parts um, now that you've got it assembled. Uh, let's say we're going to change the spacer piece. So there's things you can do in NX to work on the components inside of the assembly. Uh, you can right click on it and tell it, say, make work part. Or you can just double click on which part you want to make the work part. Uh, when you do that, it does a couple things. It changes something called the reference set, which we haven't talked about yet, uh, to the model reference set. So let's talk about that for a second. Let's go back to the spacer right now. All right, the model reference set is the one that's active because that's what uh, my user defaults for my system are set to uh, when I bring a component in. If you want to be able to see what is in that component, and let's do it with the uh, support piece because it's got more geometry. So if I go replace reference set and go to entire part, it's going to show me all the sketches and construction geometry, basically everything that's in that part file. Okay, But right now I cannot work on it. I can't do anything. I can only select the component. So in order to be able to work on that sketch, I still have to come over here and right click and make this the work part. Now I can modify that sketch and do whatever I need to do to uh, make the changes I'm working on. Now, when you want to go back to your assembly, you have to make the assembly file the work part. So again, up at the top here, I double click on assembly one, make it the work part. All right, so the shaft piece, the reference set is still set to the entire part. So now if I want to change it so I don't see the construction geometry anymore for that part, I go ahead and select the model reference set. Uh, and the model reference set is another one that's defaulted into it that is intended to only show the model. Now there are some issues with that reference set occasionally, which I'm going to show you here uh, in a second. Um, something else you can do if you don't want to work on this in the assembly file, I can right click on it and I can hit the next option underneath work part is open in window. And if I didn't have that part open already, now it opens it in its own window up here. Um, and if you're using an older version of NX, you could, uh, I think it's uh, change displayed part is the name of it. And it changes it to that part. Um, so now I can work on it in here. Now, here's one of the problems with the model reference set. Let's add a little construction geometry to this. 
Oh, that's not. So I'm going to make an offset face, which is not really important for this part, but it's another piece of geometry that I have in here. Okay, so let's say I use that offset face to make something in here. But when I go back to my assembly now, um, in this part, it's still set to the model reference set, but that surface that I just created is showing now. Well, the model reference set automatically adds things to it. So it's one of the ones that's built into the template file that you started with, the model template file, and it automatically adds uh, solid objects and sheet bodies to it. So that can become an issue if you're doing a lot of modeling on more complicated parts than this. Uh, if you've got offset surfaces or freeform surfaces that you're using to create geometry, it's going to show up in that model reference set. So if you want to edit the reference set, there's a way to do that. So we go under menu, format, find the reference sets while we're in this part file. Pick the model reference set and I can do some things here. I can remove things from it. So if you hold the shift button down and deselect objects, uh, it removes them from the reference set. So only what's highlighted is gonna be on this reference set now. I can obviously go back and add things to it by just selecting them. Um, so we can do that. We can edit the model reference set. The other two reference sets uh, we cannot model or edit. So the entire part reference set is always going to show everything in that part file. And then there's also one called empty, which shows nothing for that component if you change it to that. So I can't edit those two, um, but I can edit the model one. Uh, we cannot get rid of empty and entire part either. I can get rid of the model reference set. Um, so that's something that you might want to consider doing because, like I said, it's set up to automatically add things to it. Uh, so there's a couple things you can do. You can make your own reference set. So sometimes I will just go over here and hit the add new reference set and call it uh, part or something. And just add that piece of the model to it. And now if I select that reference set in the assembly file, It's not going to show any of the construction geometry ever because my reference set, the one I created, will not add things to it automatically. So that's one way you can do that. Or you can continue to clean up the model reference set all the time. Um, or you could even delete the model reference set and not worry about having that one uh, in your set reference sets. Now, something else you can use reference sets for uh, that I'm not going to get into in this topic, but when I do wave geometry linking, and I want to link something from one component to another. I use reference sets when I start to have too much geometry where I can't find what I'm looking for in certain components. So I'll make one just for linking things and I will use that, uh, and turn that reference set on and be able to find the geometry that I want to link in my assembly. Um, so I think the next step is going to be to create a quick exploded view and show you guys how to get that into drafting. So one thing I'm gonna do real quick is edit the object display of these parts so we can see them a little bit better since everything's the same color. All right, so that's a little bit better. Now we can see some of the other parts in there. All right, so next step is going to be to make an exploded view because eventually maybe you're going to do a drawing of this. You need to see what that looks like in an exploded uh, assembly drawing. So we're going to go up to our assemblies tab, and there's an exploded views button here. When we hit the down arrow on that, really the only option right now is going to be to create a new explosion. So if I hit that button, gives you the option to name the exploded view. So if you had multiple explosions, maybe you had a really big assembly and you were explosions of uh, sub-assemblies, uh, you could name it for whatever that exploded view was controlling. So I don't really need to name it on this one. Now I hit okay on that and it 
kind of flashed and doesn't look like it did anything. But now if I go to the exploded views uh, menu again, now I have other options available to me. Uh, so next thing I'm gonna do is hit edit explosion. And one thing that looks really enticing is this auto explode components. Um, every time I've tried that, it just puts the components all over randomly and it doesn't really have any rhyme or reason to it. So it doesn't look very good. So I kind of avoid that one. Uh, and it's really easy to do this when we do edit explosion. So what I'm going to do with this assembly is everything's kind of built vertically here. So I'm going to select objects. So you select the objects that you want to move. That's what this button is for. Once you get everything selected that you want to move, you hit the move objects button. You get a drag handle. Now, right now it's got a snap set on it. So it's got a snap of one inch set on it. If you don't want that to happen, which I usually turn it off because then you can just kind of drag things up and get it a little smoother. Another thing, the trick that I use is I try to get this oriented on the screen, kind of how I want the view to look because I'm going to have to save that in a little bit. So then I make sure I've got the parts exploded enough. Uh, that it looks good in the way that in the view I'm going to use. All right, so once we get done with that move, I'm going to go back to the select objects and I'm going to deselect that spacer. Go back to the move objects again. Move this guy up. And do the same thing again. Go back to select objects. This time I'm going to drop that support piece off. And I'm going to move those guys up. Now, <clears throat> there's also an option to um, move the handles only. So since this part is rotated, I can't just drag these straight out or they're not gonna be aligned with the pivot piece anymore since it's rotated at an angle. So if I go to move handles only, what I'm gonna do is orient the X axis to the center axis of this hole and then I'm gonna go back to select objects. And I'm gonna drop the pivot piece off. Oh, and I guess I have to do the move handles only again. So I'm gonna line that up again with that guy. Go back to move objects. So I can move that one out. And Move that one back through the other side like it should be. And right click and hit fit so I can see what my exploded view is going to look like. And it looks pretty good. So I'll just hit OK. So the next step is going to be if you want trace lines in there, you can do that now. So there's a, if you go back to the exploded views uh, command again, trace lines is over here, the little icon far right. And this is also another really easy thing to do. So it's just kind of going to draw trace lines between the points that you pick. Um, so if you want all of them in. And I picked something wrong there. Let's just start that over. So I'll zoom in here and put one between here. And sometimes you have to make it wireframe to get that edge. Okay, so those are pretty simple because they're straight ones. Now, this whole subassembly goes into that yellow support piece. So I'm going to put one from there to the inside hole there. And it puts a lot of nice little jogs in it for you so that it gets it in the right spot. And you also have the ability to move these around. So all these little arrows you can pull if you don't like exactly where it is or it's interfering with one of the components on the screen, you can move it and get it so that it's not in the way of that. Um, so you can get all your trace lines in and hit okay. You can also double click on these to edit them. So they are just an object that you can edit. So if you need something to change or delete one, you can delete them also. Um, so that's the part of creating the explosive view. Now the next step is going to be something you have to do if you want to put it on a drawing. Uh, 
if you're going to put this into drafting, you need to take another step that's not part of the exploded views. Uh, you're going to go under menu, view, operation, and hit save as. And you want to have this rotated on the screen exactly how you want your view to look in, on your drawing page. And you're going to save this view and call it exploded or whatever matches your exploded view name if you're doing uh, specific exploded view names. And hit OK. All right, so what that does is it saves a view that I can use in this orientation. Uh, so let's go ahead and go to drafting application. start a drawing. Uh, I'm going to get out of this and go use the uh, base view command. So I'm going to add a base view for my drawing. Now when I change the down arrow to uh, pick which view I want to put, the one that I saved is on the list. So it says exploded. So you can see when it shows that view, it's exploded and it's got my trace lines in it. If I do a front view, it's not exploded. It's back together. So it will only show up as exploded in the view that you saved while you ha are in the exploded view command. So go ahead and place that view. Uh, one thing that it does, which I could have turned off, but it puts the center lines in automatically. So sometimes those get in the way of the trace lines. So you can delete them or you could have changed your view settings when I created this view and turned them off. Um, so a couple other things real quick. Parts list is up here uh, in the home drafting tools. It's going to be pretty straightforward. You just drop it down on the part drawing somewhere. Uh, it adds the component names, the quantities, and it gives them a label. And then if you want to put the balloons on, there's a couple different ways to do that. But the easiest way is to right click on the view boundary and find where it says auto balloon down here. And then it automatically adds the balloons for you. Um, sometimes it doesn't put them exactly where I want them. So I can double click on it and change where the arrow is pointing, move them around a little bit. Uh, it also does not put an arrow on every instance of the components. So like this bushing, there's two of them. It only put it on this one. So if you want to label those, you'll have to do it manually by adding a balloon label up here. and putting the text in it yourself and then adding it to the drawing. Um, but other than that, it's pretty straightforward. All right, so back to the model for a minute. So the exploded view is something that you can turn off and on. So if I go back to my assemblies, exploded view commands, I can turn the explosion off, change it to no explosion, and it puts my model back the way it was. Uh, so making an exploded view is just a temporary snapshot. It's not going to change any of your assembly constraints or the orientation or location of those parts uh, on your finished assembly. It's just a, a little picture of it uh, exploded that you can use on a drawing. So I think that brings me to every, the end of what I wanted to cover with this. Uh, if you have any questions or comments about anything I showed you today, please leave it in the comments below and we'll try to get back to you on that. And uh, also, if there's anything else you want to see that I didn't cover, um, I can try and help you out with that. Uh, and thanks for watching.